Hey everybody, it's Matt. Welcome or welcome back to the Journey Church Podcast. If you haven't yet, be sure to subscribe to this podcast so you can automatically get our weekly episodes. And you might want to go ahead and subscribe to our Journey YouTube channel as well. You'll find messages, music, interviews, inspiring stories, and more for you all right there. Now, I hope this episode helps you take your next step in following Jesus. Have you ever found yourself with a problem you didn't know how to fix? We've all been there, right? Maybe it was at a, for some of you, I guess, at a national level, you know, we've got, we got problems in our nation. I wish we could fix them. I don't know how to fix them, but it drives me crazy. You've got problems in the world. I wish I knew how to fix them, don't know how to fix them. But we all also know what it feels like to have problems personally uh, with people or in our own lives. We're like, I don't know how to fix this. I just wish I could fix it. And I was um, a little hesitant and thought a while about whether to share this with you, but I think it's so important, it's worth you knowing. I actually know how to fix all your problems. I know that, yes, so thank you for the chuckle, because people are like, really? It's, okay, I know it sounds a little arrogant, but I'm, I'm not trying to be arrogant. I know how to solve all your problems. It's really pretty simple. I could solve every problem every one of you have in here with this simple way. Everybody should just think like I think, and all the problems would be solved. Yeah, exactly. All the problems would be solved. And while I'm at it, I think you should feel like I feel and react like I react too. And then we wouldn't have any problems. You you know, now hang on, because if you're new around here, especially you're like, honey, grab your purse. We have a narcissist as a pastor. Let's get out. You know, no, 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 no. The reality is we all are a little bit like that, aren't we? I mean, you're kind of like that. I know you don't admit you're like that, but you kind of think this too. And I'll prove it to you. You do fight and argue with people, don't you? Yes. You know what you're doing every time you have a fight or an argument? You're in a fight or an argument because they won't think like you think, feel like you feel, or react like you react. So maybe there's a little narcissist in you too. Maybe there's a little narcissist in all of us. Today is week two of a series called Love, Money, and the American Way. If you were not here last week when we kicked this off, I'll give you a quick recap. Uh, Basically, I started with this question. I ask if there was one thing you could change in your life, if you had the power to change any one thing that you believe would make you happier, what would you change? So in other words, if you come up with one thing, oh man, if I could just fix that or change that, I'd be so much happier. It it makes such a huge difference. What's the thing you would change? Now, whatever your answer is to that question, there's a term for it. In systems thinking, it's called a leverage point. A leverage point is just where you change one thing and it changes a lot of things. You improve one thing, and it improves a lot of things. That's called a leverage point. And I can probably guess what your leverage point is. I could probably guess what your answer to the question would be, not because I'm smart, but because uh, we're all Americans and we all tend to think in very similar ways. And as Americans, whenever we get, think about becoming happier, we reach for one of two dials, okay? So your answer might fall into the category of love. So it might be, oh yeah, it's relationships, you know? Not necessarily romantic relationships, but just relationships. If I could make things better with my spouse, or if I could get a spouse, or if I could change my dating situation, or if I could make things better with my kids, or my boss, my coworkers, you know, whatever it may be, that neighbor. You know, for you, it might be a relationship thing. If I could just change that, I'd be so much happier. If that was not your answer, then your answer for the rest of us would probably fall into the area of money. If I could just make more, save more, spend less, get out of debt, you know, however that looks for you. We all tend, and I I get this, we all tend to think if I could just make things better relationally, if I could make things better financially, then I would be happier. But let me just remind you, or remind you again, that there was a moment in your past where you dreamed about being where you are right now. In other words, there was a moment, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, when you were in college, whenever it was, and if you're in high school or college, you know, in your 20s, you may not have had this experience just yet, or you might have, but there was a moment in your past where you thought, if I can just be there relationally, if I can just have those kinds of relationships, or if I can be here financially, and you are actually living out the dream that you had a few years ago, you're actually where you always hoped to be, and you have discovered it still doesn't make you happy on a constant or continual basis. Why is that? Well, because as much as all of us humans want to be happy, there is one thing we want more than happiness, and it is meaning. All of us want to wake up every day and know that our lives matter, that what we're doing that day makes a difference. We all want to face struggles and suffering or pain and feel like there's going to be a purpose to it, that life's not random, that pain's not random. We all desperately need meaning, and we're all chasing, without realizing it, we're all chasing meaning in some way, and meaning and happiness are interconnected. 
in a lot of ways. Which is why when Jesus was on this earth, he introduced a different leverage point for us to consider. He introduced a different idea to try to tweak to make us happier and to help us find meaning. He talked about the idea of trust. Now, this was important. And the reason Jesus talked about this so much is because he knew the power of trust in our lives. We don't think of it this way, but as we start talking about it, you'll go, oh yeah, that's true. The object of your trust always determines the outcome of your life or the outcome of your journey. So in other words, trust is so powerful. Whoever or whatever you trust has so much influence in your life that it will or he will or she will influence all of your decisions and influence your direction in life and where you ultimately end up. Which is why even though Jesus talked about love and money a whole lot, he didn't dismiss these things, he would always come back and say, the reason that life isn't where you want to be isn't because you need to just change that relationship. It's not because you need to improve your financial situation. There's something underneath all of that, and it's your trust. You need to change the object of your trust. And when you learn to trust someone or something different, you will be happier and you will find meaning in both your relationships and your money. Now, you know the American way. The American way is to trust ourselves. This is who we put in this circle. This is what we all grow up. You know, we love independence. We value independence. We've all been taught, take care of you. You know, if it's going to happen, it's got to be up to you. So all of us have a tendency to trust ourselves when it comes to this. But when it comes to the relationship between trust and love or trust and relationships, putting ourselves at the center is a real problem. I'll tell you why. What is the biggest barrier to happiness in your relationships? It's conflict. It's conflict. Why do you have conflict in relationships? Why, do you, why can you not be on the same page? Why do you fight? Why do you argue? Because they do not think like you think, feel like you feel, or react like you react. And you think they should. I think they should. And when I think or expect or assume people to think, feel, and react the way I do, then I have just put myself as the object of my trust. I have made myself the standard, and you're not meeting the standard, and so you need to change because clearly I'm right. And there are a lot of problems with this. We'll get into this in a minute. But one of the most harmful uh, consequences of doing this is that when I put myself at the, at the center, when I decide I'm going to trust me before anyone or anything else, I'm going to be the standard. I have just made myself the end of life. In other words, the center of the priority, which means I cannot experience meaning because by definition, the only way you experience meaning in life is if you make yourself a means to a greater end, a bigger end, a more significant end. If you make yourself a means to something bigger and better and more significant in life, that's how you find meaning. You never find meaning when you think life begins and ends with you. So when I put myself in that circle and I say, I'm going to trust me in this relationship, I sabotage my ability to experience happiness in the relationship, and I sabotage my ability to experience meaning in life. Now, the easy thing to do would just be to say, stop it. <laughs> but we've all tried that, right? We've all tried that. As a matter of fact, here's how you know when you've fallen into this trap, because sometimes it's hard to see. Here's how you know when you've fallen into this trap. You engage in a combination of these three behaviors. You condemn, you compare, and you criticize. You condemn, you compare, and you criticize. I know I have put myself as the standard, as the object of my trust in this relationship, as, as the one that I think everybody's got to think like me and feel like me and react like me, I know I've done it when I find myself condemning. I'm done with you. I can't believe. I don't understand. Clearly, you're not willing, and I don't, I don't know why you wouldn't, so I'm just done with you because you won't think the way you ought to think like I think. You won't feel the way I feel. I'm done with you. Or when I compare, I'm better than you. Okay, if you could just be a little bit more like me. I don't understand. It's not so hard. You know, do you see how I do it? You should do it that way. When I compare or when I criticize, and when I criticize, you know what I'm doing? I'm putting myself above you. I am, I am literally acting as if I have the authority and the position to look down at you and say, let me tell you all the things you don't have right. But I clearly have it right because I am your standard. And if I'll teach you how to think and feel and react a little bit more like me, but I'm going to criticize you when you don't. 
All of us have a tendency to engage in these behaviors. And the reason, none of us ever see this part, but the reason is because we have made ourselves a standard and we assume we are right. And so everybody should think, feel, and react the way we do. Meanwhile, on the other side, and you've been on the other side of this, right? If I condemn you, what do you feel? You feel shame. If I compare and treat myself or act like I'm better than you, what do you feel? You feel insecurity. If I criticize you, what do you feel? It diminishes your self-worth and your sense of value. So again, none of us, I think, intentionally set out to do that. But all of us have been guilty of it. And we know, we know these three behaviors do not make relationships healthier. We know that. But we can't stop doing them. You know why we can't stop doing them? Because we are not willing to change the object of our trust. We're not willing to remove ourselves from the circle and release the idea that we're the standard and everybody should think, feel, and react the way we do. So interestingly enough, Jesus in his most famous sermon, he talked about this. It was almost like he knew us, huh? Like this would be a problem. He, he talked about this. And he put his finger on why we struggle with this. And then he showed us how to fix it. Here's what he said. Do not judge or you too will be judged. Now, this has been, this verse or this statement has been misapplied at times. Jesus is not saying here by don't judge that you can't have moral judgments on things. You can't see things as right and wrong. He's not saying you shouldn't have hard conversations in love with people where you're talking about things that, you know, maybe they're doing that you think is going to be harmful to them. He's not saying that. This word judge literally means to condemn. So Jesus is saying, hey, how about you not belittle and berate people? How about you not cancel people? How about you not get so frustrated with people when they won't think, feel, and react the way you do that you just give up on them, that you're done with them? How about you not do that? Because after all, he reminds us, for in the same way you judge others, you're going to be judged. In other words, if that's how you treat other people, guess what? That's going to end up being what comes back to you. Now, let me just ask you. Whenever you are not your best version of yourself, okay, you lose your temper, you're impatient, you're greedy, you're stingy, you're selfish, you know, whatever it is. Whenever you're not your best version of yourself, how do you want to be treated by the other people around you? You do not want their condemnation, do you? No. What you want is mercy and grace and forgiveness and love. As a matter of fact, you want them to look back at you and go, hey, I know that's not what you're normally like. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. You just had a bad moment. It's fine. I mean, you want that kind of second chance, don't you? You want that kind of generous attitude and explanation. Jesus is going, well, there's no way you'll ever experience that if you're constantly turning around when somebody's not their best version of themselves and judging them, condemning them. He goes on, he says, and with the measure that you use, it'll be measured to you. This is the idea of comparing. He says, okay, if you're constantly going around saying, I'm, you know, we don't say this out loud, but acting as if I'm the standard, you know, you should think, feel, and react just like me, and you're not. So how about you become a little more, bit more like me? I'll show you all the things you've got wrong. Now, Jesus isn't saying this is how life should work. He's just saying, we all know this is how life works. If you treat other people that way, that's probably how other people are going to treat you. And you're going to end up losing the ability to have meaningful, healthy relationships because you'll never be able to stop condemning, comparing, and criticizing. So Jesus says, let me show you how to fix that. And he asks us a question that none of us really want to answer. Here's what he says next. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eyes? So this is somebody you've got a relationship with. And you pay no attention to the plank in your own eye. To which, if we're honest, we read that question and we're like, I think you got confused, Jesus. You just misspoke because they've got the plank and I've got the speck. You know, it's, it's, they're the ones with all the problems. I'm pretty close to right on most everything, you know. So if you, if you took the blame pie, because there's a blame pie for every situation. If you looked at this conflict between us and you took the blame pie, I'm going to acknowledge that there's a tiny little slice of that that's mine. You got to zoom in real close to see it, but it's in there, you know. I'll acknowledge that. But the majority of it's theirs because after all, after all. 
she compared me to my father-in-law. What do you expect me to say? He said I was just like my mom. They said that I could never and I always and I couldn't believe, you know, I just reacted the way I reacted because of what they did. So I got a little slice of it, but they're the one with the plank. They're the one with the big problem. I don't really have much of a problem. I'll try to react better next time, but I don't have much of a problem. Jesus goes, no, no. You are confused. You've set yourself up as the standard. And so you can't see your own issues. You're blind to them because you assume you're right and everybody should think, feel, and react like you. He goes on. He says, let me ask you, how can you say to your brother, how can you say to this person you're in conflict with, hey, let me take that speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? To which if we're honest, we would say, well, I can look at them and tell them, let me fix your problems because I think I've got mine fixed. That's why I can say that. Because I do view myself as right. I do view myself as a standard. I do trust myself. I put myself right in the center of my life. I'm trusting in me, and they should follow me. Jesus says, nope. You have just assumed a role that is not yours to assume. You, me, we are not the standard. He makes that very clear. He gets a little mean. He says, you hypocrite. It's like, you don't have to be that harsh. He's going, no, no. You know what a hypocrite is? A hypocrite is someone who assumes a role that's not theirs to assume. He's going, oh, you're, you're trying to be somebody you're not. You're trying to do something you have no right or authority to do. You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye. Then you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. When you choose to trust you, and when you become convinced that you're right, you're the standard. I know you've got a few flaws here and there, but for the most part, I mean, you're the standard. And if they would think like me, if they would feel like me, if they would react like me, everything would be better in our relationship. The minute you do that, guess what you have done? You have just created a blind spot where it is impossible for you to see your own issues. You've got planks. You've got big problems. You don't know they're there. You don't even want to see them because you're the standard. They're the ones who need to change, not you. And you will blow their issues out of proportion. You will magnify little things in their lives and condemn, compare, and criticize while ignoring the massive issues in your own heart. And Jesus' point here is, If you want to have healthier relationships, if you want to learn how to stop those behaviors, condemning, comparing, criticizing, you have to stop trusting you. You have to stop making yourself the standard. You have to replace in the circle here, you have to replace you with him. He is the standard. And let me tell you why that's good news. If you start and if I start comparing ourselves to Jesus, we go, oh, there's a big gap. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm not as great as I thought I was. We begin to see all the issues that we've condoned in ourselves while criticizing in others. And all of a sudden, if Jesus is my standard instead of me being the standard, then my gap is so big, I'm not really worried about how big his gap is, and I'm not really worried about how big her gap is. Because the reality is all of our gaps are so big that we might as well all be working on stuff together. I'm not nearly as critical. I'm certainly not going to condemn. I'm not interested in comparing. Because I realize how far I have to go. So I don't have the time (laughs) nor the motivation to criticize you for how far you have to go. This was Jesus' point. You change the object of your trust, you will treat people differently, and your relationships will get better. So let me ask you a question. What's your plank? You have a habit of condemning people? I'm just, I'm just done with them. Berating, belittling them, just canceling them. I'm, I, can't, I can't understand. I don't know why they can't get their act together. I'm just done. You find yourself comparing a lot. You find yourself looking at people and in essence sending the message, I don't know why you can't be more like me. 
I'm better than you. Why don't you let me help you get your act together? You find yourself criticizing a lot, pointing out all the flaws in other people, acting as if you have the authority and you're sitting in a position where you have the right to show them everywhere they're wrong. What's your plank? If you see yourself as a standard, you can't see your own plank. Now, here's the irony of all this. Now, I'm not trying to get mean here, but this is true for all of us. If you started telling me about somebody you're in conflict with, and I looked at you and I said, well, what's wrong with them that they need to change? You would rattle a list off for me without even breathing because you've spent all your time focused on what's wrong with them, right? But if I said, wait a minute, what's wrong with you that needs to change? you would look at me like I'd have lost my mind. It's like, ah, you'd have to think for a while. When I ask you what's your plank, some of you are like, I don't, I don't know, I don't, I don't know. I guess I'm supposed to have one, but I don't know, you know. That is just a sign for you and for me that we made ourselves a standard. When you're more aware of the faults in others than you are your own, Jesus is not the standard by which you're measuring yourself. You've set yourself up in that role. And you're a hypocrite, according to Jesus. I didn't call you that. I think you're nice people. But he said, you're a hypocrite. I'm a hypocrite because we are assuming a role that is not ours to assume. We're assuming a role, let's be honest, we shouldn't be in. We're not qualified to be the standard. So what's your plank? Maybe you need to figure it out. Maybe you need to go to some people this week and say, I've been way off base. Condemning, comparing, criticizing. I'm sorry. I'm sorry if it's created shame in you. I'm sorry if it's created insecurity. I'm sorry if it's devalued you. I'm not any better than you. I'm not the standard. You know, it takes a lot of humility to remove yourself as the object of trust and to put Jesus in. But that's the very humility you need to make some relationships right and to get them healthy again. Now, this idea that Jesus is the standard, if you're sitting there thinking, I actually am not comfortable living that way because I will feel like I never measure up. I, I can't live with that kind of weight. I can't live with that kind of burden. I can't live with feeling like I'm always failing. No, no, no. <laughs> this is the beauty of this. You misunderstood Jesus. Because he showed up on this earth in a human body and he showed us exactly what it looks like to live out the standard. He was perfect in every way. And it was very clear, the gap between him and how he lived and all of us. He saw it. He knew it. And what did he do? He did not one time condemn, compare, or criticize No, he walked to a cross and he took your condemnation and mine for us. And he said, there's no need to compare. I'm opening up the door for you to be forgiven and to become a part of God's family. And why would you ever need to compare when you're a son or a daughter of God? No need to compare. I'm giving you my perfection. I'm making you right with God. Everything's good. And he did not criticize because why would you criticize someone that you love so much you would give your life for them? So when there's a gap that you see, you don't meet Jesus' standard. That gap, Jesus does not fill it with condemnation, comparing, or criticism. You know what he fills it with? Love, forgiveness, grace, an unconditional acceptance. That's why he died. That's why he rose again. So you wouldn't walk around with the burden of there being a gap. You would know he filled it for you. So you want happiness and you want meaning in your life. You want to have healthier relationships. Stop trying to be something you weren't created to be. You're a really bad standard. So am I.
You're a flawed standard. So am I. Nobody needs that. Let go of control. Let go of trying to put yourself in the center. Let him have that spot. And you trust him. And you'll experience the love and forgiveness and acceptance you need to be able to look to the person on your right and left when they have gaps with you. And to be like, oh, don't worry about it. <laughs> don't worry about it. We've all got a long way to go. Don't worry about it. We can work through this because I'm not going to respond to you by judging you. I'm going to respond to you with love, grace, and forgiveness just like Jesus has given me. That's how you learn to live free. That's how everything has greater meaning and happiness, no matter what you're going through and what you're facing. That is how Jesus intended for us to relate to one another. So figure out what your plank is. And let's look in the mirror and work on ourselves. And let's let him worry about being the standard and changing people and fixing things because he's way better at that than we are. Let's just focus on letting him fix us. And in the process, we'll be able to better enjoy the relationships with the people all around us. Let me pray for us. Father, it takes a whole lot of humility to do this. And it is not easy. Because we want to be the standard. We, we want everybody to think the way we think, to feel like we feel, and to react the way we react. And we think they're wrong when they don't. But that attitude and mindset just blinds us to the areas where we're wrong. We don't even know it. To the planks that we carry, to the big problems that we ignore. And that ends up sabotaging all the things we care about most in life. So would you help us to have enough humility to surrender the center of our lives to you, to stop trusting ourselves to trust you. Help us to have enough humility to go to the people that we've condemned or criticized or compared and offer some apologies. Help us to break these habits that tend to break down the relationships around us. And most of all, Jesus, thank you for filling the gap between us and you with your love, grace, and forgiveness, and acceptance. And that's what we are confident you will offer us every time we mess up in the future as we figure out how to love people the way you do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, if you'd like more content like this, subscribe to our YouTube channel and download our Journey app to access all of our recent message content. And our app is the easiest way to share this content with a friend. For more information on our church or to find our app or our YouTube channel, just visit journeycalway.com. That's journeycalway.com. Thanks for listening.